All right, now this morning, of course, today is Father's Day. And um, if you recall on, on Mother's Day, we preach a sermon for the mothers and, and the important role that a mother has to play. And so today, being Father's Day, I'm going to preach on the father's role and how important that job is. Because with we've already given you know um, proper respect and, and, and um, just given the amount of importance on the mother's job because it is extremely important. It is something that 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 is extremely necessary in a child's life. Well, I believe a father's role is equally important, that you need to have both. And unfortunately, today we have families being ripped apart. We have divorce, you know, children being raised either by their father or just their mother. Um, and and it's, a really, it's a really, really bad situation to be in. It's not the way God designed it. There are certain attributes and certain characteristics that are inherent in men and in women and children, whether it's a son, whether it's a daughter, they need to have both influences in their life. They need to have them both. They need the nurturing aspect of their mother. They need the mother to love them and to take care of them and to feed them and clothe them and do, you know, and do a lot of things that the mother typically does at home. But they also need the father. And we're going to get into some, um, a few, just a few main points about your role as a father. If you're a father today, if you're going to be a father, that you need to understand that are very important. And um, then we're going to get into a few examples from the Bible of a, of a good example and a bad example of the fathers in the Bible and, and just kind of uh, exemplifying how, how important that role is. Now, number one, and the reason why I started off here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, even though this chapter is dedicated pretty much to talking about widows and, um, and, and taking care of widows and making sure that, that they're... they're um, provided for and that if they're you know if there's a widow in your family that hey look it's a family's job you should be taking care of that and so that the church doesn't have to now the church is here especially it's it's mostly here for people who you know they're widowed and they don't have any family they don't have any children they have no one else to take care of them hey the church is there to take care of those people but if you have family members if you know if you have a widow in your family hey it's your responsibility you need to take care of them but um that's not what this sermon is about at all, but what I want to point out here is look at verse number 8 of 1 Timothy chapter 5. It says, But if any provide not for his own, and this is talking about widows, but this could be applied to more than just widows. If any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now look, fathers, your role, one of your, one of your main roles as a father is you are the provider for the family. You need to make sure that your family's financial needs are met, that you are providing uh, everything that you need to do. You know, whether if that means you have to go out and work two jobs, if that means you have to work three jobs, whatever it is you have to do, you need to make sure that your family is provided for and taken care of. And the Bible says that if you're not, and there's so many of these stinking, deadbeat, lazy dads out there that, that don't want to go out and get a job, they don't want to work, they're going to sit on the couch and their wife is going to go out and work or whatever. They're going to send other people off. They're just going to sit and collect government money instead of getting off their rear ends and going and getting a job and paying their way and paying their children's way. Hey, the Bible says if you're like that, is you've denied the faith, you are worse than an infidel. What's an infidel? An infidel is someone who's not a believer, right? An, an unbeliever in Jesus Christ, an unbeliever. So who doesn't believe in God, you are worse than that infidel if you're not going and providing for your family. Those are some strong words right there. God is being very, very serious about this in the Bible, saying, look, you need to provide for your own, especially for those of your own house. Not just the extent of that, but look, you need to make sure that you are providing for your own household. God wants you to work. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, the Bible says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. That was said unto Adam. After, after, after Adam sinned, after Adam and Eve both sinned, the, what, you know, God said, hey, look, by the sweat of your face, you're going to eat your bread. You're going to work hard. You're not going to, not everything, you know, in the Garden of Eden, before they had sinned, everything was provided for them without having to do any work. I mean, they were able to just, just pick food off of the trees. You know, they didn't have to do any cultivating of the land. The land was nice. It was fertile. God had taken care of everything. But because they sinned, one of, the, one of the things that they had to do, one of the curses was, hey, now you're going to work by the sweat of your face in order to eat your bread. And that's that way even today that we, we, you know, as men, we need to work hard to provide that food 
for our family. The number one job here, or at least number one on my list, I'm not, these aren't necessarily in order of importance, mind you, so when we go through these points, you know, they're all important. You shouldn't leave any of them out, okay? You are a provider for your family. And it, the Bible says if you're not a provider, you're worse than an infidel, if you're not going to take care of them. So you need to step up in that role, in that position, and work as hard as you can, how, as hard as you need to, for sure. You need to, and, and here's the thing, as a father, and, and this applies all throughout for every of these points. Your children are looking up to you. You are a role model for your, you are the number one role model for your children. You're, you're, the mother and the father are the two people that's, that should be spending the most time with your children, that should be the ones that they love the most, the ones that they look up to the most, that they're going to be looking at and examining. And, and, and the little things, and it's funny, being a father myself, the little things that your kids pick up on that you do, you, you don't even realize sometimes that you do, they start repeating that. They'll say things that you say. They'll do things that you do. And, and, um, and they're, they are really intent, man. They, they pick up everything. So you need to make sure that you are being the, the proper example that you need to be, that you could keep yourself living upright and accountable for your children's sake. Even if it's not for your own sake, for your children's sake, hey, you better make sure you're living right, you're doing right, you're providing. Hey, your children see you going out, you're working real hard. The amount of work they do, they may not understand it when they're young. A lot of things they won't. But when they grow up, it's going to have that impact that you didn't even realize that it had on them. You could show you've instilled a work ethic in your children just by you getting up every morning. Getting up, going to work, staying at work, coming back home. Now, in the short term, you might, you know, children might be like, oh, man, you know, I don't get to spend that much time with you. Hey, you're doing it for them. They'll realize that. They'll understand that when they see you going out and working and working and working and working. Now, look, it's also important to spend time with your family. But when you got to work, you got to work. That's your job that you're providing. You have to go out and do that. Now, don't get too caught up in the riches of this world, as we preached many times before, and get too caught up in just money and just accumulating riches. Right? There's a difference between providing for food and for clothing and for shelter for your family. There's a difference between that and just having all kinds of stuff that you don't really need. Right? So uh, it's a balance. Everything is a balance. You have to balance your job appropriately. But number one, you have to be that provider. You have to provide the food. You have to provide the clothing and the shelter. Now look, ultimately it's coming from God, but God expects you to work for it. God expects you to be doing your part. Okay, God's not going to just let you just sit around and be lazy and do nothing and coddle you and take care of you. Again, a loving father wouldn't do that. A loving father is going to say, no, you need to get up and do your work and instill in us that work ethic. And that's what we need to do. And um, so that's number one. Number two, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter number five, just a few pages back at words from First Timothy, just um, a, few, a few books back. Ephesians chapter five, not too far away. Ephesians chapter 5, of course, Ephesians 5 gives us a, a great outline of husbands and wives and, and our roles in the family and stuff, but we're going to be focusing here on the husband and, and you know, applying that as a father. My second point as a father, look, you're the leader of your family. You're the one that needs to be providing the direction for your family. That is your role. That is your job. We'll see here in Ephesians chapter 5 that the wife is supposed to be submissive, that the wife is, is subject and authority structure in the, in the, in the family. And, that, and God has placed the, the husband or the father in charge in that role of authority. There has to be somebody making decisions. There has to be someone that says, this is what we're doing, one way or the other. Because if it wasn't that way, if, if you say that, well, no, the husband and wife should have absolute equal power and authority and equal say in everything, what happens when you have a disagreement? What happens if you're trying to decide something, especially something really important? How are we going to raise our children? How are we going to do, you know, when it comes down to that, if you have a disagreement and you're both equal, then who's to say that one should go with one or the, over the other? Which is exactly, and that's just going to cause extra fighting, extra hardship, extra strife, right? But when God has already laid it out for us, we don't have to question it. Say, oh, okay, well, I guess when that comes up, it's the, it's the father, it's the husband. He's the one that makes the, the rule, and that's it. And you know what? Ultimately, that's the bottom line. That's what God said. And we'll, we'll take a look at that here real quick. Ephesians chapter 5. Look down at verse 23 of Ephesians chapter 5. 
The Bible says, well, look at verse 22. The Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. God has ordained the family structure. God has ordained this, that, that the husband or the, you know, the father is, is in that role of being the one in charge. Now look, with that responsibility comes a lot of, you know, you, you, have to, you have to take that seriously. It is a responsibility. Having that authority, you need to be responsible for that. You need to be make, making sure that you're making the right decisions. If that's going to fall on you, hey, now all of a sudden, you've got a lot of stuff that you need to, to make sure that you're, you're doing right. Now, notice here, though, too, the Bible doesn't say that the husband is ahead of the wife only when he's right and the wife's wrong. It doesn't say that. It says that he's the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now look, <laughs> men are human beings just like women, okay? Men make mistakes. Men aren't perfect. That's not why God put the husband in charge. It's not because they just know everything and they're always right and the woman's always wrong and that they're just perfect. No, that's not why he did that. But he did put them in charge. Now, you might, you know, a good way to relate this is to your boss at work. I have a boss at work. There's a man that owns the company, and I work directly for him. Now, do I think that he's always right in every single business decision that he makes? No, I don't. But guess what? It's his business. And if he says we're going to do something a certain way, I'm not going to say, well, no, you're wrong. You know what? I'm just going to go and do what I, what I think is right. And you might say, but my heart's in the right place. I want the business to succeed. I know that this is right. I know it doesn't matter. And that type of subordination, hey, that's, your, that's enough to get you fired. Boss is going to look at that and say, hey, I, I told you to do this. You know, it doesn't matter what you think. If I tell you to do this, this is the way it is. And that's the way authority structures work. I mean, it just makes perfect sense. It's the same way in the house. Now, obviously, your wife's not going to get fired, but <laughs> um, you shouldn't have to worry about that, right? We don't believe in divorce. But, um, but the bottom line is, I mean, look, God has laid out what our roles are supposed to be. And it's, it's not that difficult, you know. It, there should be some kind of comfort for the wives in the sense that, hey, you don't have to have the stress of, of being responsible for making the hard, a lot of times, the really tough decisions. I know as a father and as a husband, you know, I really try to make sure that I know as much as possible. I make the most informed decisions for my family. And that if that means staying up late and doing research and doing whatever, because there's an important decision to make, hey, that's my job. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure that what I'm doing. And you know what, men? You also ought to be the spiritual leader in your house as well, which is going to mean picking up this book and reading it for yourselves and reading through it and making sure that you know what this says since you're going to be the one making decisions anyways. Hey, God's going to want, God gives you the wisdom that you need to make the righteous, righteous judgment and righteous decisions. But you need to get that from his word. So being in that position, being in the, in the role that you're in as a husband, as a father, you need to make sure that you are in his word and that you know and you gain that wisdom, you gain that knowledge from God to help you to make the right decisions, to be the best role model that you can be, to be the best husband or the best father that you can be. We need to make sure that we're in his word. And look, as a father, you are leading and directing the path that your family is going to take in all of your, your life's decisions. That is an extremely important role. Your family depends on it, right? I mean, the decisions that you make are going to affect everybody. They're going to affect your children. They're going to affect your wife. All of that needs to be taken into consideration when the decisions are made. It's, um, it's not a light job. It's not a light responsibility. The being a father is not an easy job. It's a tough job, but you need to, you want to make sure you're doing it right for your family's sake. And that's why I see it's such a great example in Ephesians chapter five of likening the husband and the wife and Christ and the church, right? Because the Bible even says here that even as Christ gave his life for the church, because he loved the church so much, 
He gave his own life. And that's the way that we need to treat our family is that, look, you're willing to give your own life. You love them so much. You, you're, you're interested and concerned about their well-being, about their safety, about their protection. And when you make those decisions, it's based out of that mentality of knowing, hey, I need to make the decision that's going to help them out the most, that's going to help us succeed as a family the most, and that they're going to be safe, they're going to be protected, be provided for in everything that I do because I love them. Because I love my family. So every decision that is made is, is with their good intent, with their, with their, with their benefit in mind, with, their, you know, with what is going to be the, the, the best for them. That is the, the mindset that we have, the way that when Christ went through his ministry here, when Christ was suffering persecution, when he was going through the hard times, when people were mocking him, when people were spitting on him, when he was getting beat up and whipped and nailed to the cross, you know what he had in mind? All of us lost sinners. Love out of us. That's what he had in mind when he endured that stuff. And he didn't complain about it. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't say, oh man, I got to go through all this hard stuff. Look, he did it. He took it as a man. And as a man, as a father, when you have a tough job to do, hey, don't complain about it. That's your job. You just do it. You know, if you have to stay up late and say, oh man, I'm working all these hours. And, and you know, I, I, it's just so hard. Stop complaining. Look, Christ didn't complain about the job he did. It's, it is what it is, and that's your job, and that's what you need to do. And, that's, and you want to be a good role model, example for your children? Don't be a complainer. Because I'll, I'll tell you what, when you start complaining about things, I guarantee your children are going to grow up being complainers too. That's exactly what's going to They follow you. They look at you. They watch what you do. They follow your example. It's not just the things that come out of your mouth. They'll know when you're being a hypocrite. That's why it's so important to, to walk the walk, not just to talk the talk. It's one thing, hey, you need to talk the talk. You need to preach to them. You need to give them the truth. You need to give them this wisdom and understanding. But hey, that's not going to have nearly the same impact if you're not doing it. They're going to look at you and say, Dad's a hypocrite. You need to be doing the things that you're teaching them. You need to be that example for them. Number three, turn to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, it's right near the, just after the book of Psalms, right near the middle of the Bible. Psalms, a real big book in the Bible. And um, right after the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs, we're going to look at Proverbs 3. And I'm going to read for you from Hebrews chapter 12. While you're turn, you turn to Proverbs chapter number 3, because the thir my third point here in the role of a father is you need to discipline your children. That needs to happen. Now look. The wife's job, the mother's job is raising and rearing the children and being a keeper at home and doing that. But, so she should be primarily, you know, making sure that, that if discipline needs to be meted out, if these things need to be taken care of, because she's there, typically when you're at work, she's going to be taking care of that. But that does not mean, and I firmly believe this, that does not mean she's the only person that should be, should be giving the discipline out in the family. And I'm going to show you from the Bible that that's the case. That it's not just the wife's job to be doing that. It's the father's job as well. Now, again, primarily, just by, based on the amount of time that the mother's going to be spending with the children, yes, she'll probably be doing more of it. She should be, you know, because she's teaching them and training them as well. But, um, and I'll read for you from Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 6. The Bible says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, scourging is a whipping. It's a whooping, Right? The Bible says the Lord, for whom the Lord loves, if, if God loves you, he's going to chase at you. He's going to whoop you. Okay? And it says, every son whom he receiveth, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? So you're saying, what kind of son is it that, that a father doesn't discipline, a father doesn't whoop, a father doesn't correct? It says, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. He's saying, look, if you're not getting disciplined by God, that's, you know, whereof all are partakers, you're a bastard. You are not God's son. You're just some illegitimate child out there that doesn't have a father to, to love him and discipline and correct him. He says, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? 
And again, all these references talk about God the Father chastening his son. A father has a job and a responsibility to discipline their son or daughter as needed. To discipline their children, to chasten them, to, to, to scourge them. I mean, it's a, <laughs> that's what it says. He scourges every time he receives it. Give them a whooping when they need it. Right? It's not just flying off the handle every little tiny small infraction. You just give them a whooping. But it's when they need it, you're teaching them and you're correcting them. You're in Proverbs chapter 3. Look at number 11. Verse 11 of Proverbs 3. It says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Basically, and, and, and we, I'm not going to turn to all the different scripture that talk about, you know, spanking your children, essentially, about, about correcting them, chasing them, and using the rod to correct them. I'm not going to turn to all those this morning. But um, in both Hebrews and in Proverbs 3 and elsewhere, the Bible says that if you don't, if you don't discipline your children, if you don't spank them, if you don't, if you don't give them the proper discipline, you don't love them. The Bible says that you hate them. And um, it, that's why it says here, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. You, you, you discipline, you correct your children because you love them. That's the whole purpose is because you want to teach them right from wrong. Look, you care about them. I get it. Spanking is not a pleasant thing. I never like doing it. It's not enjoyable. It's not something that you like to experience. You don't want to see your children in pain for any reason. But the pain that they're going to experience as a result of a, of a spanking on their rear end is going to save them a tremendous amount of pain that they'll experience later in their life from growing up by not being corrected and not being disciplined properly. You have to have that understanding. And that's why you have to have that faith and know, hey, I love my child. I love my son. I love my daughter. I'm going to give them the correction that they need right now as God has told me to, as God has ordained in many places. Again, we're not going to turn to all of them just for sake of time. But if God's, God's telling you, look, I'm going to discipline you because I love you, because of your father. What son is there that the father doesn't discipline, is what he's saying. Who, you know, what kind of father doesn't discipline their son? And he says, if you don't get disciplined by me, then you're a bastard. You're not even a son. That's, those are strong words. But that's the way he feels about it. And look, as a father, it is important that you are also in that role and... and um, receiving that reverence because it's important look it's important for your children to respect you one way to earn their respect is by is by showing them by doing the right thing that you're not being a hypocrite that you're telling them to do something and you're following the same way but you're also going to get that respect when you when you hand out the disciplining because you're going to say no things are going to be done my way in this house as the the head of this household these are going to be the way the things that are going to be. And if you, if you disobey, there's going to be a punishment. There's going to be a consequence. And it's important to have that stinging consequence too, not just a time out. Because look, God has consequences for our sins. When we break his law, there is an ultimate consequence for our sins and it's called hell. As a young child, you could grow up understanding, hey, when I break the rules, when I break my father's rules, there is a consequence associated with that that doesn't feel good. And it actually has a real consequence to me, and it feels bad, and I don't like it. And if you get a group of people growing up these days that never were spanked, they don't even understand the concept necessarily of, 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 of getting a physical punishment based on your, your misdeeds, and that's why a lot of kids grow up today not even believing hell's real, you know, or not believing in God. And if they do believe in God, they say, oh, yeah, I don't, you know, love, God's love, and he would never send anyone to hell. And they have this type of mentality because, it, because it's an imbalance that, no, look, when you do wrong, you're going to receive that punishment. Hey, we've sinned. We deserve that punishment of hell, and it's real. And you kind of, as a young child, you, you get to, to understand that a little bit better, I believe, when, when you receive that disciplining and say, hey, there is a consequence for my actions. There is something that's going to happen that's not going to feel good. And you learn it in, in a small way, right, just by, by breaking some of your parents' rules, but, but you can apply that and gain that wisdom and that understanding of, well, 
when they start learning God's rules, well, God also has a punishment. The same way that dad has a punishment for you when you break dad's rules. God has a punishment as well, but obviously we, we have salvation where Jesus Christ has paid the punishment for us. It's not that the punishment didn't get paid, because it did. Every punishment for our sins has been paid. God didn't just look the other way as if, as if no punishment was paid whatsoever. The punishment was paid. It was just that someone else took our place to pay that punishment for us. Right? I mean, it would be like with my children. If they deserve a spanking, hey, they're going to get a spanking. And what Jesus did for us it would be someone else just, just stepping in. Either way, the discipline's being meted out. It's being handed out. Um, it's not just completely saying there's no punishment whatsoever. But um, anyways, you know, as a father, we need to discipline our children. That's uh, how you're going to raise them the right way. You're gonna, you know, the Bible commands us to do that. And there's, uh, if, you, if you need to see more scriptures on that after the service, come to me. I'll be happy to show you many other places that, that teach that teaching on how we ought to be correcting our children. But number four, I won't spend too much time on this. i got a lot more to do. I'm only on my first page here. You know, as a, let's recap a little bit. As a, as a father, you need to be the provider. You need to provide for your family. You're the leader. You're the head of the household. You're making important decisions. You need to discipline your children. And not only discipline, but number four, you need to teach and to train your children. It's extremely important. You can't just have the disciplining. You can't just have the correcting in the, in the physical sense. You need the correcting in the teaching sense as well. You need to instruct them and give them the ways and say, okay, what you did was wrong, but not only is that wrong, hey, this is the right way. And you need to teach them and train them and focus on this is what you need to be doing. This is how you ought to be coming up. If you're in Proverbs 3, flip back to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, look at verse number 8. The Bible reads, My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. And all throughout Proverbs, you'll see that um, a very similar statement, if not the same statement, um, where Solomon here is, is writing out these Proverbs and just saying, My son, you know, hear the instruction of thy father. And the instruction of thy father all throughout the book of Proverbs, very common statement. And think about what are instructions? When, uh, when you're putting together, when you're assembling something, right? You get a toy for your child, and it comes with a, with a set of instructions, right? It's a step-by-step. -step. Okay, first you need to take this piece, and then you take this screw, and then it goes in here, right? It's a, it's a whole less list of instructions to get to an end, to get to the goal. And as fathers, you need to be instructing your children on the right way to live. And a lot of times you have to be breaking it down real simple and give them all the steps laid out. This is where you need to go. And this is the end goal. And this is how you get there. And you're going to instruct them. And you're going to give them God's word. And you're going to teach them. And you're going to show them and, 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 and explain to them and tell them, hey, you're going to have these types of experiences in life. And this is how you deal with it. You're going to have people that are going to, that are going to come up to you and do bad things. Hey, you're going to have people coming and enticing you to go and do evil. This is how you deal with it. This is how you respond. This is, you know, it, it, and, and there's so many different life examples that as a father, you need to make sure that you are teaching your children to equip them, to prepare them, and to help them to go in the right way so that when, when situations arise, they're not stuck not knowing what to do. Not having the wisdom, not having that guidance, and just just going with whatever. They need to be taught and educated, trained at home by their father, by their mother as well, but by their father. This is we're, we're focusing on the father's job. It is also a father's job to be to be participating and in instructing your children. The Bible says in Proverbs twenty two six, and this is a very important verse. The Bible says, "Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old." He will not depart from it. Great words of wisdom. Great promise from God's word. Hey, if you train up your child in the way that he should go when they're young, you train up that child when they're old, they're not going to depart from it. It's a great, great, very um, consoling, very comforting to know that the amount of work and the amount of... And that just shows... Hey, it's so much more important when they're young to put in that time and that effort and that work. I know it's hard work, but I think that's why typically, you know, you're younger when your kids are younger. And I do all the time. I mean, you're always younger when your kids are younger, right? So you have kids when you're younger. Yeah, it's a lot of work and you might not get very much sleep. <laughs> but it's worth it. And when you're younger, you can handle that. So when, so when you're older, 
right? <laughs> and your kids are grown up. Well, it's a different situation. You don't have to deal with that same, the same workload of, of making sure all the providing and all the teaching and training because there's going to be a point where your teaching and training is done. They're grown up. They're gone. And hopefully you've done the right job so that they don't depart from it. But once you're done, you're done. I mean, there's, there's no more... You know, you could try, but yeah, go ahead and try teaching and training after, after the child's already grown up and has gone in his ways. It's a lot, lot harder. Not that it can never happen, but it's, you, need, you, need to, you need to get them when they're young. And you need to, to, to really teach and instruct them as a child and invest the time, man. It's worth it. It's worth it. There's not, it it'll, it'll pay off way down the line, but you need to put in the work and the effort now and understand that how important it is. The Bible says in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible reads, Ye are witnesses in God also how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe, as ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. So the Bible says here, and I'm going to focus on it, verse 11, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged. Every one of you as a father doth his children. So he's saying, look, these are things that a father should do with his children. Exhort, comfort, and charge. Now charge would be the giving of instructions, right? You're giving them charges. You're telling them what to do. This is what you need to do. But the exhorting and the comforting, again, important. The mother's job is typically one that's more of a nurturing type of relationship. But fathers, I know some, you, you, you're the one in charge. You have that authority. But make sure you're also providing comfort for your children. Don't be so hard that they can't feel the comfort and the love that you're only just a disciplinarian or you're only just, just rattling off you know, charges to them to go do. You have to have that, that, that other aspect, which it's a little bit more difficult for men. I understand. Look, it's not always easy. Um, it's gotten a little bit easier for me. These girls melt my heart. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I don't know what it's like with a son, but these little, these little ones can just, can just melt your heart. But um, they need to be exhorted. They need to be, they need to be lifted up. They need, they need to be um, you know, told that they're, that they're doing well. They need, they need to, be, to be assured and comforted. And that's, that's another job. The Bible says in Colossians 3.21, says, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Right? You don't want your children to get discouraged and to get down and to think that they're no good and they can't do anything. You need, you need to, to, yes, correct them when they need correcting. Yeah, don't, I mean, you can't, all, you can't bend on your rules in a lot of cases. You know, I mean, there's, you could give long suffering and mercy, but at the same point, you know, you need to teach them and you need to, you need to stick to that and you need to discipline, but you need to instruct them and also just give them the, the comfort and the support that they need as children so that you're not discouraging them, you're not provoking them to anger. Right? You don't want to just put, and, and you can do this pretty easily as a, you know, as, as a much more mature and knowledgeable person. You know what buttons you can push on your children. And your children are, are, you know, they don't have their temperament under control. They don't have um, the, same, the same type of ability to control themselves. So it would be really easy to push their buttons and to provoke them. Right? And you can just start saying things and you know it's getting under their skin and just messing with them and saying, look, obviously, you know, you play around a little bit with your children, but, but don't provoke them to anger. Right? You don't want them to get discouraged. You don't want them just getting angry with you and, and for, no, for no reason at all, for no good reason, and just provoking them. Right? There's no reason to provoke. Now, look, if they get angry with you for disciplining them, that's not your fault. You know, obviously, you still need to teach them and train them and stuff, but... But don't provoke them under anger. Don't, don't make it so that you're just, just goading them and pushing their buttons to provoke them under anger. Now let's look at, there's got two examples. I'm going to try to get through this pretty quick. First we're looking at a bad example of a, of a father. Look at 1 Samuel chapter number 2. 1 Samuel in the Old Testament. First Samuel chapter number 2.
We're going to see Eli. Now, the story of Eli, Eli is a priest. Eli is a priest of God. And he's actually an example of someone who's a godly man that ended up just being a, ba a bad father. He failed as a father. And um, that is totally possible because you need, to, you need to pay attention to all of the things that you need to do with your family and don't get too caught up in everything else. You know, it's, you know I, I think of myself as a pastor. I've got a lot of work to do with this church. I've got a, lo a lot of work to do. And it's important to esteem others better than yourselves. It's important to go out and help people. It's important to do these things. But don't let that come at the expense of your family and children to, to where you're just failing as a father. Now look, there's sacrifices that need to be made. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. But you need to treat your, your role as being a father extremely important and make sure that your kids are taken care of. Okay? Um, and I don't know where exactly Eli slipped on this, but we could see some traits with Eli. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 2. I'm going to read, we're going to read a, a whole section of this and then we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Look down at verse number 12. The Bible says, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. That means they were sons of the devil. Belial is just another name for the devil. Okay? His sons, and it says, um, they knew not the Lord. So number one, the first mistake, he did not raise them to, to, to know the Lord. He did not teach them and train them the way you ought to. They grew up to be meant to sons of Belial. And don't forget Proverbs 22, right? It said, um, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he shall not depart from it. Obviously, Eli failed because if he would have trained them young in the way that they should go, they wouldn't have departed from it. But they became sons of the devil. And they knew not the Lord. Let's keep reading. It says, And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three uh, teeth in his hand. And he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. So just to give you just a synopsis here of what's going on, you know, people would bring their offerings. And in, in the Old Testament, they bring their offerings to the Lord. And, you know, of course, the Levites, the priests, they would get to eat that offering. But God had ordained the way that it was supposed to be prepared, the way that it, the, the, they were supposed to be offered and sacrificed up. And it was very detailed, very specific. And what they were doing they were sending people out and they were getting these flesh hooks, right? And saying, okay, before, you, before it even gets offered, and see, the fat was supposed to be burned up as a sweet savor to the Lord. That was the Lord's, right? They're coming in and saying, no, we want it raw. You're just going to let, we're just going to take and defile your sacrifice, essentially is what they're doing. We're going to take this. We're going to take what we want. And if you say something about it, we're going to tell you, hey, we're going to take it by force. You want to talk against us? We're, gonna, we're just going to do this, right? And they're threatening violence against people, even if they try to do things the right way. So it says that people abhorred, that means they hated going to offer their sacrifices to the Lord because they had to deal with these guys, you know, threatening them and doing things the wrong way to the point where people didn't even want to go and sacrifice unto God. Now that's a very serious sin because they're preventing people, they don't, they're, they're making it so people don't even want to go and do what they're supposed to be doing according to God's law. They're, they're, they're causing them to sin and they're sinning themselves in a great way against the offerings that are supposed to be made unto the Lord. Let's keep reading. Let's jump down to verse number 22. It says, Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? 
Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. Jump down to verse number 27 there. It says, And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people? You see here, God is blamed. This is a man of God came to preach unto Eli and to tell him basically what God had, thinks about him and what God had said. This man of God came and rebukes Eli. Now, we saw just previously as Eli rebuked his children, right? He says, why are you doing these things? And we, and we find out there that they're even sleeping around and fornicating with women in the church. I mean, the women that are coming up to the, to the, to the tabernacle, they're, they're committing fornication with these women. They're really bad, wicked men. I mean, they're, they're sons of Belial, right? They're stealing God's um, sacrifices and doing things the wrong way and then, and, and then committing a fornication with women in the church. And yeah, okay, we saw Eli just rebuke him, but he didn't stop him. He didn't prevent him. He didn't do what he was supposed to do and be like, no, you guys are out. You're not going to be, pre you know, like you've transgressed. You're done. He just rebuked him and they didn't even listen to him. Obviously, that seems to be a pattern of probably things that were going on in their entire life anyways. Their sons were, were men at this, at this point. Eli was really old. It's not like he's, you know, he's rebuking them. They're already grown men. He already failed in his job as a father. But now God is saying that, look, you honorest thy sons above me. By him not disciplining them appropriately, not taking the right actions and making the right decision as a father and, and disciplining them the way that they need to be and, and making sure that they're, they're punished the way they ought to be, God says, you're putting your sons above me. And that's, that's never a place you want to be. Look, God takes our number one spot over everybody. In our lives, God is number one. God is above your, your husband, your wife, your children, everybody. God gets the number one spot. You can't love your, your children or your sons or anyone else more than you love God. That's not the way that he wants it. God wants you to love him personally. We all should have our own personal relationship with God, with our Father. He is the one that gets our first and primary attention and affection and love. Now, I believe right after that is your spouse and your children, right? As, as, as people that you need to be loving you know, most in your life. But God is number one. And he's rebuking Eli here for putting his sons above God. It's wickedness. Verse 30 says, Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me. For them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall, light, shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, and there shall not be an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in, the, in my habitation, and all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. This is a major curse given unto Eli. There shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine, whom I shall not cut off from mine altar, shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. He's saying your, your, your family, your household, your, your um, descendants, they're not going to live out their lives. They're all going to be cut short. In the flower of their age, he says, the ones that, that even do live, they're going to they're gonna be there just to consume your eyes and to grieve your heart. It's a very serious curse here. It says, And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons on Hophni and Phinehas, and one day they shall die, both of them. And, um, and I'll just read this for you. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 17, it says, And the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there hath, also, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. This happens when the Philistines come, and Israel goes out to battle. They go out to fight with them. Hophni and Phinehas, his sons go out with them, and they have the ark of the covenant, and they're, they're, you know, they're going out to fight, and God's not with them. And the Philistines defeat them, right? And just previously there, we just saw in chapter 2, a man of God 
prophesied that, that Eli was going to lose his two sons. That they're going to die in the same day. They were both going to die. Mm -hmm. And that all these other things, this curse is going to come upon them. And so here we see in chapter 4 that this is exactly what happened. They both die in one day. It says in verse 18, it says, And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake, and he died, for he was an old man and heavy. And he judged Israel 40 years. So this, well, it says that he was heavy. You know, he was leaning back on a chair, and he fell back, and he broke his neck. It says he was an old man, but he was also real heavy. Right, so he was he was a very large man. He had a problem controlling his appetite, and I think one of the first things we could learn from Eli with these children is that the children have a tendency to follow in their father's sins. I made reference to that a little bit earlier, and a lot of times when this happens is that they'll increase that sin even more. They'll 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 take the sins of their fathers and 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 make it even worse, and it'll just multiply it even worse. Um, we see here Eli, he was a large man. He was a heavy man. Well, his sons, they also ate too much, right? They were, what, was their, what was their focus on? It was on the food. It was on, it was on the, the sacrifices that were being brought unto the Lord, right? So Eli was a man. He was, he was given to too much food. We could, we could gather that from here. And we could also see that in his sons. Now, it's one thing to be given to too much food, but it's another thing then to be just stealing it from people and to be stealing it from the Lord. And that was the next step that his children took it to. Right? You take, you take one sin of, 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 of just you know, not taking care of your body enough and, and, and being a little bit gluttonous and, and, and you know, eating more than you should. And then it's, now we see his sons... They're stealing from people, bringing in the sacrifices, and um, they're also fornicating with the women in the church, which just kind of shows their, their lustful attitude, lusting for the food, and then lusting after women. It spills over into the other areas. They became much worse, and, and, it was, um, and you could kind of link that back a little, I believe, um, to, to Eli. And, and, and it's, you know, he, for one, he wasn't teaching them properly, and for two, they were, they were building on his sin. Now, this also happened, if you remember, and it's, there's many examples in the Bible. I'm not going to go through them. Um, we're really running out of time here. But think of uh, King David. You remember King David, the king of Israel? He had multiple wives. He had a few. I don't remember exactly how many, like seven. He had, he had, he had multiple wives. Again, a sin. The, the king is not supposed to multiply wives, the Bible says. The Bible says, you know, man shall leave his father and mother and, and cleave unto his wife, not his wives. You know, we're... They're supposed to be married to one person. You know, polygamy is never endorsed in the Bible. But we see here a man, and a man after God's own heart. Again, a righteous, godly man. You know, he had his own sins, but, but his sins that he did and, and is taken of multiple wives, well, look what his son Solomon did. His Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. A th I, can't, I mean, I can't even imagine that. <laughs> a thousand women. A thousand he took the sin of his father and just and just went with it and ran with it. Hey, what, and, th and, and you know what? It kind of makes sense. Well, dad did this. If dad's doing this, then, I mean, if, if he had seven, why not 700? Right? I mean, if it's okay to have seven, then it must just be okay. What's, what's the big deal? Dad did it. And that's the mentality. Now, that's, that's not the mentality that you should have as a child. You know, you should never have that mentality. And, and think of yourself with your father. Look, just because your father did certain sins, hey, that doesn't mean it's okay. But it is something that has a tendency to happen. It's something because of the way that you're taught and you're growing up and you see this and you see the certain sins. So you want to be real careful about what you're getting into and, and the sins that you're doing in your personal life and think about what kind of an impact that's going to have on your children. How are they going to look at that? And then what are they going to do in their lives as a result of your sin? And not only should you worry about your son following in your steps, right, as, as, as important, but even just the ramifications for your own sins. When you sin, it's not just yourself that's affected. It affects a lot of other people, and it's definitely going to affect your children. The Bible says in Exodus 20, when God's given out the Ten Commandments, in Exodus 20, verse 5, it says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Talk about false, you know, about idols, false gods. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So you're saying, oh, you want to get into idolatry? You want to get into putting other gods before God? 
He's going to visit your iniquity. Is what he's saying. The iniquity of the father. I'm going to visit your iniquity upon the children on the third and fourth generation. Your children are going to end up paying for it to three and four generations later. Now this is pretty serious. He says of them that hate me. You know, it's all about putting up idols, putting up false gods. But even if you don't do that, the sins that you commit and the sins that you do can be can be your your children can experience the backlash or the punishment as a result of your own personal sins. It's not just you who's going to have to deal with that consequence. Other people are always affected. Real briefly, I'm going to give you, we got a good example of Abraham as a father. Um, the Bible says in Genesis 17, I can't get into this, I'm, I'm pretty much out of time. But in Genesis 17, 23, the Bible says, And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among them, among the men of Abraham's house and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the self same day as God had said unto him. Now one of the things I want to point out here is that Abraham didn't hesitate at God's word ever. Abraham did and, and especially concerning his family Right? He took his uh, Ishmael and he took everyone in his house when God gave him the, the seal of circumcision where they had to circumcise themselves. Hey, the self same day. Now look, that circumcision isn't pleasant, especially if you're an adult. Right? I, can't, I can't think of wanting to do that. That's not something that I would choose to want to do. Right? But he didn't give it a second thought. In the self, God said, this is what I want you to do. This is what you're going to do. I've given you this seal. And Abraham said, okay. Okay, we're going to do that. And he did that for not just himself. He made sure that his whole household, everybody in his household, his servants, his son, everybody was going to follow what God had ordained here. He was stepping up in that role. He was being the leader and he was saying, we're all going to do this because God said to do that and this is right. And that is a great example of a father. And he did that in other situations. You think about when, um, no, just his faith, you know, Abraham was an old man when Isaac was born, and he was the son. He was the son of promise, right? Abraham was a hundred years old, and then later on, God tells him to go and to, and to offer up his son for a sacrifice. Again, no hesitation from Abraham. Now Abraham knew. Abraham, Abraham already understood the the promise. God had already promised him that of his seed, he was going to make him a father of many nations. And he knew that it was in Isaac, his son, was this, this prophecy was going to come to pass. And God can't lie. So that's why the Bible even explains that, you know, when he went up, he was willing to sacrifice his son and to go through with it because he knew that God's even capable of raising him from the dead. If he was going to do that and, 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 let, and go through everything that God had told him to do, he understood and knew because of the promise of God, he had that solid faith in God that he said, hey... God's telling me to do this. I'm not going to disobey God. I'm going to do this because even though he's my only son, God's not a liar. He's able to bring him right back from the dead if I follow through with this. And of course, it's a real important illustration because it's, it represents Jesus Christ and him coming and sacrificing himself for our sins. And, you know, that's a whole other story. But um, one other thing I want to point out here, and we'll, we'll wrap it up with this, um, maybe two other things. It says uh, in Genesis 18, verse 17, it says, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This is, this is God speaking, right? Say, and he's talking about hiding what he's going to do with Sodom and Gomorrah. And um, this is a great compliment. And, and imagine God speaking this way about you. And this is a great testimony to who Abraham was as a father, as a parent, as a person. He says in Genesis 18, verse 19, he says, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. God saying, I know Abraham. I know him. I know the type of man he is. I know the type of father he is. I know that he's going to command his children. He's going to command his whole household and that they're going to keep the way of the Lord to do justice, to do judgment, and they're going to follow me because Abraham's going to make sure that that happens. 
Abraham is a righteous man. Abraham is a righteous father. He is a leader. He is someone that's going to make sure, no, we're going to follow the Lord. We're going to obey the Lord. No matter what God says, we're going to do it. And he was that type of a man. And God says, I know him. And he's going to command his household after him so that they can receive the blessings. Because he loves them and, and he understood the promise that God made. And he is that type of man. Abraham is an excellent example of a good father, a good husband, and a good leader. Abraham wanted to make sure that his son would continue down the right path that God had laid out for him. So he, and, and this is the, the last point, he even, he even charged his servant then to go out and find a wife for him, for Isaac. As Abraham's getting really old, and he knows that his time is coming, so he wants to make sure that his son is still taken care of. That he's, that he's going to go down the right way. And we see in many places in the Bible that if you, you know, um, that the heathen women, when you marry unbelievers, when you marry people who, who don't know God, that don't love God, they're unbelievers, they could turn a man's heart away from serving the Lord. That's what happened with Solomon. He lived a great life, but then near the end, you know, he married all these women. A lot of them were heathen women, women he was not supposed to marry, women he was not allowed to marry. And the Bible says that they turned his heart away from serving the Lord he, to where he was even building up altars unto false gods. God spoke to Solomon audibly, and he heard him, and God answered his prayer and his request, and he gave him wisdom and, and knowledge and riches and all kinds of things, and he gave him great power. Yet at the end of his life, Solomon, even Solomon, after having that experience with God and receiving all of these things from God's hand, he still, his heart turned away to build altars unto other gods because the heathen women turned his heart away. Abraham understood this. Abraham knew this. And even before he's gone, he's, he wants his servant to say, look, you need to get a wife of, of my brethren, of his brethren. You know, go out to this land, but he can't go over there. You need, you need to bring, bring someone back because, because of God's plan, because God said, you know, not to return her. God's called me out of there. And we'll read that in Genesis chapter 24. We'll close with this. It says, And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. Again, he's putting the most important guy in, in, in charge of this that's in his household. The, the, the oldest servant, Someone who's, he's, he's in charge of everything, of running all of Abraham's stuff and maintaining his goods. He's, a, he's basically at the top below Abraham. He says, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac, and the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again. He's saying, look, God doesn't want us going back into that land. He needs a good wife. He needs a wife of, of my brother. And he needs to get a wife from there. Not a, not a wife of the land of the heathen, not the Canaanites. So I, I really want him to have a good godly wife. But he can't go back there. God's called us out of that land. And, um, and he understood that. And, and as one of his last wishes, he put someone really important in charge of doing this where he's still just looking out for his children. And at this point, you know, I mean, Isaac was a, was a grown man and he's still looking out for him. He's still, he's still trying to do everything in his power to make sure that, that his, ch his child is going to succeed, that his child isn't going to sin, that his child isn't going to take the wrong wife, that his child isn't going to go back. He's doing whatever he can to help him out and to help his son out. And, and as a father, that is an extremely important role. We need to make sure that we're looking out for our children. We're looking out for our family. We're putting them first. We're making the right decisions. Being a father is not an easy job. Being a good father is not an easy job. If you're, if you're not a good father, I don't even you know, it's hard to even call yourself a father. When you're just, when you're just sitting around and, and partying and, and, and drinking and doing drugs and, and whatever and not caring about your own children and not caring how they're going to grow up, I don't even consider you to be a father. Being a father is a hard job. It's going to require lots of work. Being a husband is, is, is not easy, but being a father is even harder. Okay, it is an important job. The future depends on it. I mean, the future of your children, what they're going to do. Um, don't take it lightly. Get in God's word and know what he has, the wisdom that he has, the knowledge that he has for you to have, and, um, and to teach your children right. 
Teach them God's ways. God's ways are the right ways. Don't teach them the ways of this world. Teach them what God has. And, and in order for you to teach, you need to know it yourself, obviously. You can't teach someone something you don't know. <laughs> you have to know it for yourself and know it well enough to teach. And if, and if you're not at the point to be able to teach it, hey, get started in this. Get started today. Get started now. Put in the hours. Put in the work. It's not easy, but it's important. It's needful. Let's bow our heads a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you for being such a great father to us, dear Lord. We thank you for being long-suffering and merciful, but also for, for chastening us when we need it, dear God, for disciplining us, for scourging us, dear Lord. We thank you for looking out for us and, and, and loving us. And God, I pray that you would please help us, help the fathers, help us. that And, and if we're not fathers yet, dear Lord, um, Wherever we're at, dear God, help, help us to, to understand your ways. Help us to teach our children the right way, dear Lord. Help us to be, um, to be men of wisdom and, and spiritual and godly men, dear Lord, to, um, to be able to make the right decisions, to be able to, to do the hard work. God, strengthen us and, and help us to go out and provide for our families. Lord, I pray that you please bless us and, and help us in our endeavors to, to make good usage of our time to spend time with our children, to, to correct them when they need correcting, to, to provide for them, dear Lord, and to love them and to encourage them and comfort them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's turn to one more.